What's better than listening to the 430 movie? Seeing it recorded in front of a live audience. Join us this year at WonderCon, where your favorite 430 movie hosts will record Walt Disney Week live in Anaheim. We hope to see you there at WonderCon. If you're a fan of the only podcast for Star Trek fans with a life, then you'll love seeing your favorite Inglorious Trexperts hosts live at WonderCon. Join us for a very special guest as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of Star Trek V as we record a live episode of Inglorious Trexperts. You heard right, Star Trek V. We all hide a secret pain. See you there. The 430 Movie will be back with all new episodes and theme weeks for Season 2, this spring. But for now, we hope you'll enjoy this special encore presentation from our first season. Hey, this is Mark A. Altman of 430 Movie. This is a special encore presentation of In the Shadow of Star Wars Week. In the Shadow of Star Wars Week was the first podcast we recorded for 430 Movie back uh, in August. And uh, it really sort of defined what the show was going to be. The idea was to um, talk about all the movies that influence were influenced uh, by Star Wars or influenced Star Wars. And uh, we weren't sure at the time, you know, would anyone respond to this format? You know, what were they going to think? I mean, 430 Movie was an idea. We knew Ashley, Darren, myself, and Steve, we knew we wanted to do a podcast. And we had done two pilots. We jokingly call them The Cage and Where No Man Has Gone Before because we completely changed the format with uh, In the Shadow of Star Wars Week. And the idea was to take, as you know now, uh, the 430 Movie of Our Youth and program theme weeks, a la Planet of the Apes weeks, Monster Week, uh, Sci-Fi Week, and um, create theme weeks that never existed. And so uh, it was only appropriate that we start within the shadow of Star Wars Week. We had a ton of fun, and uh, thanks to our many listeners, a great audience, there were a lot of suggestions, things that we missed, stuff like Star Crash with Carolyn Monroe, um, and uh, uh, a bunch of fabulous uh, suggestions. But um, the one thing that came out of in the shadow of Star Wars Week was how clear... Um, that this was a great format for a podcast. Um, we really, I think, we're on to something. And, you know, uh, if this is your first time listening to the show, uh, hopefully you'll have as much fun as we had recording it. Because one thing we do whenever we get together to record these podcasts is have a ton of fun. So uh, now enjoy this special encore presentation of In the Shadow of Star Wars Week. We'll be back next week with another special encore presentation, but we'll return with all new episodes of the 430 movie this spring. This week on the 430 Movie in the Shadow of Star Wars. Welcome, I'm Mark A. Altman, and you are listening to the 430 Movie. Back in the 70s and 80s, before the advent of VHS, chances are, if you saw a classic movie, it was on the 430 Movie. Before the dark times. Before the Empire. That's With 5 o'clock. Their, <laughs> before the news at 6 o'clock. With their famous theme weeks, it was a chance to see movies you never saw and get reacquainted with some old classics. Now on the 430 movie, we take over the vertical and the horizontal and put together our dream theme weeks that you could watch at home and relive the glory days of the 430 movie. Welcome. I'm Mark A. Altman, and I am thrilled to have our ace band of programmers back to tell you what you'll be seeing on In the Shadow of Star Wars Week. From Transformers Prime and the X-Men animated series, Star Wars Rebels, and the upcoming Star Wars Resistance, writer Stephen Melching. Hello. We have conceptual designer of such movies as The Chronicles of Riddick, uh, season two of Westworld, which recently ended, and the visual effects supervisor on Star Trek The Motion Picture, Mr. Darren Docterman. Welcome. And last but not least... Uh, he is a screenwriter for such films as X-Men First Class, Thor, and the upcoming Red Sonja. And uh, he also, as a TV writer, has worked on Fringe, Black Sails, and has Lore Season 2 coming out in October, Mr. Ashley E. Miller. Hello. And I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm Mark A. Altman, a writer and producer for such shows as The Librarians and Agent X, as well as the author of the upcoming Battlestar Galactica Oral History, So Say We All. 
And uh, I'm uh, thrilled to be here on the new installment of the 430 movie. So how does this work, guys? The, basically, the 430 movie would have these theme weeks, Planet right. of the Apes weeks, Classic Sci-Fi week, uh, uh, Shrunk into Microscopic per- Proportions week, Godzilla week. And we would find out about it on the previous Friday. That's right. The previous right, Friday. Right, exactly. Yeah, you yeah, find the, out. Next week, uh, it's Ape Week. Unless yeah. you got TV Guide and, right. uh, you know, on Thursday and it said, you know, it's like, oh, my God, Planet <laughs> of the Apes Week. Right. I am rushing home from school. So we are taking it upon ourselves to um, program all new theme weeks that you can uh, create at home through home video, uh, through DVD, Blu-ray, streaming, whatever. But uh, these are weeks that we are taking over. We're p- programming the uh, these dream theme weeks. And this week we're going to do In the Shadow of Star Wars. What do we mean by the In the Shadow? Shadow of Star Wars. Well, after Star Wars came out, it was a huge influence on uh, a series of films that all came out wanting to capture the success and uh, uh, creative highs of Star Wars. Some failed, some succeeded. And we're going to program some of these great Star Wars imitators this week because, of course, the 430 movie couldn't afford to license any of the actual (laughs) Star Wars movies. So instead, we will be uh, uh, showing the imitators this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So we're assuming that this isn't a week that was broken up by the ABC After School Special. Son of a bitch, you just <laughs> took the words right out of my ah. mouth, although I was going to say, and we're not preempted by the Mets this week. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, we're not preempted. It will be five movies. And how will we do it? Well, we're going to all talk about films, and then we will decide uh, what those final five, the final five, uh, are, are going to be. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start with Steve, uh, you know, programmer number one. What, 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 what do you think, uh, what, what, what would you like to see on the 430 movie this week? Oh, boy. I mean, when you talk about the shadow of Star Wars, that is a huge shadow. That is a, you know, literally a Star Destroyer sized shadow. A um, Super Star um, Destroyer. Super Star Destroyer. <laughs> I mean, when that, it was the you executor. know. executor. That opening shot of Star Wars changed everything, and um, it. I've made, never heard that before. Yeah, <laughs> it made a whole generation of people, of kids especially, just crazy for that kind of entertainment. It was we we didn't you know some of us were primed, uh, uh, raised watching things like the original Star Trek or Planet of the Apes. There was some, uh, you know, there was some science fiction uh, content out there, but nothing that came together in such a just overwhelming and spectacular way on the big screen as Star Wars. And so, of course, you know, Hollywood being what it is, uh, they wanted to ride that coattail as as long as they could and uh, try to cash in. I think there were some long gestating projects that suddenly had new life um, if they had a, a spaceship in it or some kind of genre content. Well, it's interesting because you had – Two types of, of these in the Shadow Stars. You had these big budget studio things that were trying to cash in, like we'll talk about Battlestar Galactic, I'm sure, you know, or uh, Roger Corman, who who had made a career out of knocking off a popular trend with films like Battle Beyond the Stars. But then you had these foreign imports, like Meshes, Message from Space or the Canadian classic Starship Invasions, mm-hmm. which were just like any distributor that could get their hands on a Star Wars, something that was vaguely Star Wars-esque, right. got thrown in a theater somewhere. Right. And uh, it's the equivalent of what direct video is now or really direct to Netflix at, at this point. Um, so, Steve, do you have a film in mind? Oh, boy. Well, I mean, you know, you, you already mentioned, I mean, the first one that really came along in a big way was Battlestar Galactica. Um, and, you know, it was released theatrically um, in 1979, I believe. That's correct. It was re- released uh, theatrically in 1979. In Sense Around. That's right. No less. It, the last movie uh, released in Sense Around. And uh, it premiered on ABC as a uh, three hour TV movie event in September, uh, September 17th, 1978. Uh, if it sounds like I'm particularly well versed in Galactica, it is because I am, and I have a new book coming out this week. Uh, so say we all a complete oral history of Battlestar Galactica um, by the Lords of Cobol. I'll tell you something really funny. I was talking to Mark Hamill about what Galactica, and he said Name that uh, uh, with Star- on Star Wars or non Star Wars, but I guess when they were doing Empire, they used to call Battlestar Galactica Battlestar Copycatia. Yeah, I mean, it was the subject of a lawsuit um, that ultimately failed, as I recall. But um, uh, most of us kids, we were just I was you know, speaking for myself. I was starved for that kind of entertainment. So I was right in front of the TV on that 
Sunday night, I believe, when it premiered. Um, I happened to be living in Hawaii at the time, so our broadcast was not interrupted by Jimmy Carter, like right. I think it was in a lot of the country. It sure East was. was. <laughs> oh, was. yeah. So I, mean, I saw the whole Darren thing. Darren and I are still it, pissed about it. Yeah. Yeah. And, Stupid you know, Middle East peace. It, it, it's uh, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's funny. My, my relationship with Galactic is kind of interesting. I, uh, I loved it when I was a kid. I always thought it was kind of cheesy. Um, and now that I'm revisiting it, it's cheesy, but it's it's solid for the most part. It's a fun show. Uh, it has some wonderful designs for the uh, star, the different spaceships. Uh, some of them designed by Ralph McQuarrie. Um, uh, John Dykstra did the visual effects. Uh, he left uh, Industrial Light and Magic. To, was pushed. <laughs> was pushed. Uh, <laughs> created his own visual effects shop. And did Hugh some, Wilhelm scream. Did, did, did some really <laughs> wonderful visual effects that hold up. A lot of them hold up remarkably well today. You, you know, I was just watching it last night. And... Um, you know, some of those shots that got used over and over again because it was tremendously expensive to to create these shots on a television schedule and budget. So they, they got the most out of them by reusing them uh, in, in different ways. But um, uh, Glenn Larson created a, a great mythology um, based in part on uh, Mormon uh, the Mormon uh, religious traditions and uh, created some really fun characters and uh, a show that only lasted a single season on television, not including Galactic 1980, um, but still endures uh, to this day and, and spawned uh, the, the reboot series uh, from Ron Moore. Well, you know, it's very easy to dismiss Battlestar Galactica as a Star Wars clone, but the reality is is it took advantage of the technology that existed. Uh, you had uh, John Dykstra doing um, uh, visual effects, as you said. You have... Um, you know, Glenn Larson, who had a reputation as Glenn Larceny for taking, knocking off um, <laughs> concepts from movies, successful movies, and turning them into TV series. Now, if you take Glenn at his word, he actually had a concept called Adam's Ark, which was about a bunch of humans migrating into the cosmos looking for a new home mm -hmm. that he flipped and turned into Battlestar Galactica. But Battlestar Galactica, unlike Star Wars, was about a family. It was, a, you know, it was certainly a much more depressing concept than interstellar genocide. Um, so I feel like Galactica, if you look at it, um, it's very easy to sort of dismiss it as a lightweight Star Wars ripoff. But when you take the time to look deeper, you see there's a lot more going on there, including sense around, than, um, uh, than you might uh, notice at first blush. I've always said that, unfortunately, Galactic has the reputation of being the Rodney Dangerfield of sci-fi. You know, never got any respect. But uh, I, I think it's a very special series. I think it had a great cast, had a great concept. And, you know, um, if it wasn't always... Uh, perfectly executed but again we're just really looking at the uh the movie well, the the premiere yeah they, i mean they did their work on that they really created you know they they think they spent a fair amount of time creating an interesting mythology for the show it wasn't just a a straight ripoff they uh, created the whole idea of the 12 colonies and their their religious traditions well, and, and spirituality their... was something very new for a sci-fi uh, so you very rare. I mean, you could say the Force and Star Wars, but it was definitely Glenn Larson's Mormonism that was infused with that series, and so it brought in the horoscopes, the Geminons, the Pisces, and all that. But also, you know, the Lords of Cobol, the Council of the Twelve. Um, so there was a lot going on there. You put thought into it, There's you know. But then you also there. had a robot dog, which sort of <laughs> negated a lot of it. Played by a monkey. Played by a monkey. Two monkeys, actually. <laughs> Evie and uh, I forget who the other one was. Um, were they both in the dog at the same time? No, no. One, <laughs> one they, 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 the right well, tool for the bad. right job. Apparently, Evie was <laughs> a little more friendly. Not like a horse costume. <laughs> But, uh, you know, apparently they, they all got scared from, like, the squibs and the explosions and, like, shooting fire in space was hysterical you because... Think, so you had, like, this monkey in a robot dog suit running that, for its be... life because squibs are going off <laughs> pooping itself. Let me ask you, you think, think that would be the kind of actor that put doo-doo in the costume? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I just think what, what's really funny is, you know, you look at some of the people that ABC was originally considering for Starbucks, people like Don Johnson. And you can't imagine had, hmm. had they had they been been cast. And, and, and also uh, Barry Van Dyke, who eventually was cast in Galactic right. in 1980. Um, but well, Dirk Benedict is so great. And ABC didn't want to hire him because they didn't think it was sexy enough. Huh. I'm not going to argue. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, don't forget that Don Johnson at the time was like the Don Johnson of the A Boy and His Dog era. Yes. Right. right. Um, so he was completely uh, equal to Dirk Benedict. Yeah, I in mean, everyone. They were exactly the same. Well, yeah, because he had done the Clonus horror and Dirk Benedict had done s- Oh, s- right. S- s- yeah. which, you, which you can't even say. Which we'll do on Snake Week on the Sword <laughs> movie, along with Anaconda and... Uh... No, I, I think that uh, what you said about, about Battlestar kind of getting the, the short shrift is uh, from, I, I think at the time, critically, I think is is, is pretty fair. I don't think... Um, I, I never thought that it was a Star Wars clone. Um, I always thought there was something interesting about it. And I think there were interesting things about that show that the that the reboot never even touched uh, in, in meaningful ways. I thought that the most cool thing in that show was Count Imbley. Mm-hmm. I loved that he had the same voice as the imperious leader. And it was just, all of that stuff was just fascinating to me. And, and it seemed like there were things that could just be mined and mined. Um, and and never were, which is sad. But by the same token, it makes me want to go back and watch it. Um, and I think as well, you know, we say, well, it was only one season, okay. But it's 1979. One season is what 26 episodes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 26 episodes would make it the longest running show in the history of Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the equivalent of three seasons now. Yeah, yeah. That's and right. its numbers, <laughs> its audience numbers, probably like would if you. Took Game of Thrones, all the seasons of it, with right. all the viewers wouldn't of Game of Thrones. Wouldn't equal what Battlestar Galactic's yeah. premiere number. Not even close. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a really, really good point. Uh, no, well, I mean, let's look. Let's not forget the score. The Stu Phillips right. score is Stunning. Wonderful. Terrific. Beautiful. You know, they wanted a William S. score. They got a William S. score. And then not a lot of people can do John Williams. And Stu, Stu Phillips did something pretty remarkable. I think it's great that you mentioned Count Ibley, of course. Uh, Patrick McNee played that role. And uh, Ron Moore had actually toyed with the idea of bring, uh, doing Count Ibley in the new incarnation. They just couldn't crack it, and they abandoned doing Count Ibley. Although I think... If you look at what happens with Starbuck, there are echoes of the white ship, and of the light ship, and 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 those uh, the, the entities, whatever they were, in 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 War of the Gods, which of course is really, I think, uh, the shining moment of the apex of of Galactica is that War of the Gods two parter. Yes. Although you could argue Living Legend, but I, I think War of the Gods has a little more going on um, than than Living Legend, which is also a great episode, which also could potentially be programmed on this because Mission Galactica: The Silent Attack is. Two galactic episodes cut into a theatrical movie. It's right. it's living legend in fire and space. So that would be eligible. Although I I, I I imagine you are suggesting that we show the Battlestar Galactica telefilm in sense around. Yes, <laughs> not on television. <laughs> Look, no, no, because you remember when. Um, I think it was NBC showed Earthquake, and you could watch it in Sense Around by listening to it on the radio uh, in oh, concert yeah. with... Simulcast. Simulcast. It was yeah. simulcast on the radio. So when Earthquake was first aired on NBC, they made a big deal. Watch it in Sense Around, and you would have to tune into the simulcast on the radio to get the oh, uh, the great. bass, to get the uh, the, the, the bass channel. Wow. Oh, yeah, I did it. So I remember... It was... I, I did see Galactica in Sense Around uh, that summer. Absolutely, I, I was a huge fan. Okay. You know, so, so your think. nomination is is Battlestar Galactica for sure. Monday. Okay, we'll we'll come back to that and see if everyone agrees. Tuesday, Darren. You know, I think I, I'm gonna go a little higher rent, um, because I think one film that absolutely uh, came out of the success for Star Wars is Buck Rogers in the 25th Century. No, <laughs> although I'm sure it's coming up. Um, Alien. Alien is a direct descendant of the success of Star Wars. We're going to have to cut that to shreds, though, when we air it on broadcast TV. Well, not now. <laughs> you can show anything on broadcast TV now. Um, but it's it, it was definitely, I mean, it was started out in development as a, a B picture, a very low budget sort of uh, knockoff sci-fi thing that would have been, you know, in the drive-in movies. Uh, but the fact that Star Wars did so well really uh, bumped up the budget. And uh, when they brought in Ridley Scott to direct it, they decided, OK, we're just going full throttle on this one and we're going to give it the A picture treatment and uh, really try and, you know, make this another tent pole. I mean, before tent poles were a thing. And. Uh, you know, because it was uh, it was the same. Tents were more like sleeping bags. We didn't have poles. <laughs> Things just. I well, wouldn't know. I never went camping. Talk to the Bedouin. <laughs> um, but uh, the thing 
was that the the administration at Fox was the same. Mm -hmm. It was the same group. Yes, Alan Ladd Jr. um, greenlit this one. And, uh, you know, it was two years after Star Wars. It came out in 1979. Uh, It had a lot of the same production people involved in making it. And... uh, it wa- it it did to the sort of horror genre the same thing that Star Wars did to the sci-fi genre, mm. even though they it overlaps both of them. Um, it sort of has that sort of same lived-in uh, science fiction look that Star Wars established. Well, and it took it even further. Yeah, I mean, it went real working class. Ex- exactly, exactly. Yeah, those guys wake up and they think they're in a movie about space truckers. Right. Yeah. And oh shit. Well, they are yeah. in a movie about space truckers. <laughs> oh. And an egg. Yes. <laughs> it's like Horton, here's a who. Uh-huh. <laughs> let me ask Actually, you, it is like let me ask you a question. Is, is this better for uh, Shadow of Star Wars Week or Haunted House Week? Which, 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 would, which do you feel it lends itself? You know, I think that, I think that um, Alien doesn't really work as, as necessarily a, a horror movie. I mean, it has elements of a horror movie, but it's, it's a lot more sort of uh, tension- than horror? I mean, uh, you know, you can debate me about this, but... I would totally debate you about it. <laughs> but, but but I also see your point. It's, but it, is... it, has, it has a couple moments that are, you know, definitive horror things in it. But it is... The, the and, and Alien probably isn't possible without Star Wars. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because some could argue that it's in the same universe. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be one of those. But... Um, it definitely is their cousins to each other. I would like to see Parker running around with a lightsaber. That would amuse me. That would be really <laughs> well, cool. And it would Ian be, Holm, take this. It would, it would, be, it, it would be a purple light. lightsaber, too, <laughs> because, because we're racist. And would that be an, a, an effective weapon against an alien if you were to cut? Would it cauterize the wound? I think and it probably it would. Acidic bleeding? It probably would. <laughs> right. Wow. Jedi versus Although pa- aliens. Pondo Baba's arm is bleeding. So well, we could see it because now that Disney is buying Fox, they will oh my own God. the Alien the franchise. Star Wars Alien see Jedi team up fight exactly. aliens. Exactly. Alien exactly. versus Jedi. I, yeah. That's so awesome. And Jedi will be just right as, now. Oh my Jedi God. Jedi will be yes. just as useless <laughs> against aliens as they were against Palpatine in the prequel. <laughs> well, I mean, the guys wearing a freaking hood, they didn't know it was freaking uh, Senator Palpatine under there. Well, the alien's hood would be a lot longer. <laughs> the, the Jedi were incompetent, but that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> the galactic they idiots. were just, oh my God. They made Sarah Yuri look like he knew what he was doing. Oh my uh, goodness. That's bringing it back around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, okay, well, the alien, uh, so the, your suggestion for Tuesday is alien. That's my suggestion. A- a- Ashley, Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday, I would program one of my favorite films of, of all time. Um, and I wouldn't say it's one of the best films of all time, but uh, but it is something that um, has always made me happy and, and brought a smile to my face whenever I watched it. And one of the things I love the most about it is its fantastic pedigree. It's 1980s Battle Beyond the Stars, mm. uh, which was written by uh, John Sales, uh, John Sales yeah. who is a writer's writer. Um, wrote Not to be Lone confused Star. with Black Sales. Right, exactly, which was the show I worked on. It's spelled right. completely differently. Right. <laughs> Um, but no, but but John Sayles, who's a real a real writer. Um, it was uh, James Horner did the score, yeah. pretty much the same score that he did for Aliens and for Star Trek Two. But, <laughs> but it works. It and works every Park. time. And Gorky Park. It works every time. Jim Cameron was brought in to do special effects for this movie yeah. on the recommendation of Gail Ann Hurd. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, Bill Paxton worked on this film. Except he was a carpenter. Right. When you were time. on Lord, did you get to talk with Gail and Hurd much? Oh, yeah. Did you talk about Battle Beyond the Stars? You know what? Um, I have, in fact, had a conversation with her about Battle Beyond the Stars, but it was it was years ago. Oh, it was, okay. But it was one of the first things I wanted to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> it was just, tell me about what that was, was like. Was she surprised that anybody was asking her about Battle Beyond the Stars? 100%. Uh, oh, because it's like there's that list of things that like people will ask about, and Battle Beyond the Stars is just not at the top of that <laughs> list. It's like Walking Dead, Aliens, and then you know down here about 138... <laughs> Is Battle Beyond yeah. the Stars? Yeah, that's really by the funny. way, Ashley. Yeah, many years ago when I used to work for Jim Cameron, I discovered that he has a copy of Nell. Oh, I'm sure he does because uh, I, honestly, the HK in the Terminator is it's pretty much Nell. Very, it's yes. his only wife. Very similar. Yes, yeah. I mean, by the way, that ship 
if you turn it so that you're looking at it from like from the top, right. it's a uterus with fallopian tubes and ovaries. If you look at it from the front, it has boobs. I'm yeah. not being sexist here. No, I'm it, just saying Anyone facts. who looked at a picture no. of the ship, it, 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 there's no question. Of course it, it does. It's a boob ship. It's, it's, it's called Nell. Exactly. <laughs> and she's like a mother. Um, so she has all those things that mothers need. Like a uterus. Because that's I what guess. they did in the 80s. You would have a ship and you'd say, oh, okay, you know, some guy is going to sketch and make it look like a pair of breasts, that's which right. is what they did. Exactly. Uh, it had an amazing cast. First of all, it was starring John Boy from the Waltons. Right. And you can't top that. Well, you can, but you can't. Uh, well, who already had an action figure right. made by Mego of him. <laughs> right. Well, and then there's the great George Papard, who everybody yes. remembers from Breakfast at Tiffany's. Right. Uh, <laughs> John Saxon. I was waiting for you to say the A-team. Okay, well, there you go. Right, well, see, yeah, we're going for a little surprise. A yeah, yeah, yeah. We can talk about like Breakfast at Tiffany's on like, movies that were never the 4.30 movie week. Um, well, and we Robert Audrey Moore. Hepburn week. Why does it have to be John? Yeah, right, we could. Let's do that. Yeah, I think uh, we should. Yeah, absolutely. I'll mm-hmm. do it right now. Charade. Uh, all right. <laughs> no, right. 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 Tiffany, Sabrina, um, uh, Ro- Ro- Roman Holiday, and uh, let's see. Oh, and uh, I-, I hate Always, but maybe Always just because it was her final film. Well, there you go. Okay. Done. Okay, so, now we're done with right. that. Anyway. Done. <laughs> <Moving on. laughs> testosterone in Battle Beyond the Stars than, than, uh, than any of those films. Um but yeah, it's uh, it's it's basically a magnificent seven in space, which, as everybody Not knows, is it is magnificent seven in space, which is the seven samurai in the old in the west. west in space. So it's the seven <laughs> samurai in the old west in space, <laughs> right? It's like you even got a character it's like the a weird magnificent seven space samurai. <laughs> Pretty much, um, but it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's and it's just it, it, once you once you embrace the Roger Corman of it all. I mean, and we could probably have a whole conversation just about Roger Corman. It's Roger Corman week on no, the fourth movie. You could easily you could do weeks and weeks of Roger Corman and the people who came out of um, the Roger Corman quote unquote. We'll, 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 we'll do filmmaking. that. We'll, I'm sure we'll get to that, but, but not uh, now. Yeah, I I think you know this is one of those movies that if. If you can truly appreciate, um, especially now, I'm talking about like sitting down and kind of watching it now, sort of understanding film the way we we understand film now, and and being, um, you know, my kid's age and kind of what he's used to, you know, the level of special effects and even editing mm-hmm. um, and how things look, um, that you realize there is just there is so much passion for the film in the filmmaking. They're making this. This crazy little sci-fi Star Wars knockoff, and everybody seems to be having a great time, you know, and nobody seems to be phoning it in. It's just, it's lovely. It's so unpretentious, which I love about it, you know, unlike today where everything has to be, you know, so. Well, things were a lot more sort of earnest back in those days, and and I miss that, you know. So many filmmakers these days just want to be too cool for school, Mm -hmm. and, and they're afraid to show these kind of real emotions and and be well know. and they're afraid of the content of the film yeah. they're they're afraid of being pigeonholed into a genre mm-hmm. uh and they, they, there's just too much fear fear leads to anger and hate and all that anger stuff. and hate it's lead to star killer. wars prequels That's star right. wars prequels death. lead back to anger and hate weird i need my fear and death. over to battle beyond the stars yes. brings total obliteration and even that name it's so pulpy me. and every aspect of it is pulpy right. in a wonderful you know wonderful way and i think shout factory put out a delightful uh, blu-ray of it mm-hmm. that you know has some special features and uh, you mentioned it earlier but we can't say enough good things as much as we joke about james horner ripping off everything from alexander Nev- nevsky to you know every score he's ever done it, 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 the, his score for battle beyond the stars you know people say oh star trek 2 is such a great score battle beyond the stars is a better score yes it is and it, it, yeah. was, and it was right when he did that in Humanoids for the Deep. Well, this and was, both this was a direct rip scores. of Star Trek the Motion Picture score. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, measure for it's measure. It's so And it's, good. it's really good. It's really it's good. It's so good. Is that, is that score available? Uh, it absolutely Oh, yeah, is. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a and great score. Battle Beyond the Stars was just uh, released um, in HD on iTunes the, uh, the second week of August. Okay, so if this was going to be Wednesday's film, you can download it from iTunes to, to, to boom, program boom. Wednesday. So Battle Beyond the Stars would be our pick for Wednesday. BBS. And, uh, <laughs> okay, um, and again, we, we will lock these in once we get to Friday. But right now, I think we're going to have a couple of winners uh, until we get to me. Because I am going <laughs> to nominate for Thursday, In the Shadow of Star Wars... 
I'm, I'm reluctant to say it, to subject myself to, um, to, to <laughs> mockery. It's going to be Starship Invasions, isn't it? No, as much as I love Forbidden Christopher World. Lee. No. <laughs> That would be Alien Week. Okay. You know, because that, there's a whole bunch of ripoffs of Alien, you know, Forbidden World, Galaxy of Terror. See, that, that, could, Aliens. I mean, it's so funny because we could put that on, <laughs> on, you know, all, it's so modular because like Alien could fit in this, it could fit in Alien Week. And I mean, there were all those Alien ripoffs. Um, it could fit, like you said, and, you know, there's so many places for it to go. But, um, I'm going to nominate, and, and, and it is indeed a Star Wars ripoff, self professed Moonraker. Oh uh, yes, Moonraker. I should have guessed reading your Twitter feed this morning. <laughs> I, 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 I I've been thinking about it. I mean, I thought about Star Crash and I thought about Buck Rogers and you know a bunch of these films. Uh, but I, I I'm going to go with Moonraker because the thing about Moonraker is I wouldn't nominate it for James Bond week because it's not a great James Bond movie, but it is shut your mouth an incredibly entertaining, awesome, uh, fun. It, it you know it, 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 you know basically uh, if you looked at uh, Spy Love Me it says uh, James Bond will return in for your eyes only, but Star Wars was such a success mm -hmm. that the producers you know Cubby Broccoli <laughs> decided to capitalize on the success of Star Wars. Do we have any James Bond novels that involve? space in any way well we have one that spaceship. involves a moon not a space station <laughs> but uh there was moonraker which was uh, you know hugo drax is just threatening uh london with uh, an atom bomb which of course isn't big enough for 1979 and uh as a result um uh, the, the the book is completely thrown out um other than the name hugo drax as the villain played by the wonderful sneering michael lonsdale and um uh, and they do, uh, you know, they go. Bond, James Bond goes into space. He has a laser battle on board <laughs> da Drax's secret space station. Um, you have Lois Childs as a brilliant NASA astronaut. Um, so, and and Derek Mennings, it's 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 clearly the high point of his work. Although you could argue that Spy Love Me was the high point of his miniature work because uh, the the stuff he did with Atlantis and Spy Love Me is is brilliant. But the space station, all that stuff, they 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 were so up against it in terms of um, time that the, that stuff is an optical printed. It's like they the way they did the 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 the, the laser battles is 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 just incredible. Well, let me tell you, the reveal. Of the space station still is a thrilling shot where the you see just the, the, the sliver of the light, sliver yeah, of yeah. It, and then as the sun rises over and illuminates the rest of the station with the music building, it's it's fantastic. Well, it also has one of the great Bond teasers of all time, um, which oh, unfortunately yes. gets a ridiculous button, but it's 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 where James Bond is pushed out of a, a plane without a parachute. And then in mid dive, steals the parachute from the other, from the antagonist, and then yeah. Jaws comes after him, and they fight in mid air, and it's great up until Jaws, the Richard Keel Jaws, not the shark Jaws. <laughs> yeah, Although if it had been the shark, <laughs> <laughs> this time it's personal. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, you know, and then Jaws, unfortunately, um, uh, uh, flaps his flaps arms his and arms and ends up uh, crashing into a circus tent uh, to the music, the cal calypso music, and it just sort of it's a dead you know, sort of tag and it's really sad because it's much like the end of Fear Eyes Only teaser where it's a great teaser up until, you know, Blofeld says, um, I'll buy you Mr. Uh, Delicatessen, Mr. Bond, you know, before he dumps him in the, the smokestack. That's a, that's a recurring problem in Moonraker. It has some terrific action scenes that's that undercut. are always undercut by a silly joke at the end. Which is why I think its reputation is, you know, most serious Bond fans consider it one of the, the worst Bond movies, which I do not. Um, yeah. I think if you accept it on its own goofy terms, it works within that paradigm. But yet there's also some really great scenes. There's that wonderful scene where uh, a Bond is leaving the Drax estate and um, there's an assassin hidden in the trees mm -hmm. with a rifle. And uh, they're going skeet shooting. They're shooting the ducks or the pheasants or whatever. And um, Bond misses the, the, the target, you know, this, this flying bird or whatever it is. And, 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 and Hugo Drax says, you missed. 
And he goes, uh, did I? And uh, the body drops out of the tree. The and you see the assassin has been killed by, mm-hmm. by Bond. And uh, it's such a great moment of dry wit. And Lonsdale's really good with the sort of, you know, he's like, uh, f- uh, you know, see that some harm comes to Mr. Bond. You know, take care of Mr. Bond. See that some harm comes to him. And oh, uh, it's Bond coming, flying into LAX in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And getting but they a- filmed in France. <laughs> yeah. So it's like they fly into LAX and they take they the helicopter, helicopter out to his... French estate, which is supposed to be like in Studio City or something, <laughs> you know, it's like it's hysterical. It's so rid- I mean, that's more ridiculous than the radar jamming space station. <laughs> and uh, uh, and then, of course, I, I just absolutely love the Dobermans chasing oh, Corrine Clary gosh. through the yeah. w- woods and then killing her, you know, as the camera pans up. And the, that's the magnificent, magnificent John Barry score. Yeah. I mean, it is it is one of the great Bond scores. It's lush and beautiful and romantic. And um, it's just, there's so much to love about it. It's never boring, it's you know? It's very entertaining. It's, it's super goofy, entertaining. but it's very entertaining. And, and I, it's great action scenes. I mean, the chase in Venice and the canals is great. But then they undercut it with the joke. With the pigeon. With double the double take. take pigeon, which is uh, insane. I mean, it's just... Whoever's idea, I mean, to do, I mean, just like, why? Was it the editor? Was it Cubby? I don't know. But I mean, that is just, there's, you know, yeah, no, you know, the it's, double it's, take Sometimes pigeon. those things just seem like a good idea in the edit room. Like, oh, this is funny. Yeah, let's do it. Do you think they kind of like woke up, like, you know, after, you know, you spent the whole night drinking? You're like, I did what? Okay. <laughs> and they're like, oh, shit, we got to go make for your eyes only. And like, they just got up and they just went and just made a completely I think different. At, the, at that point in the Bond, franchise i think they were having a lot of second guessing as to what bond was supposed to be Mm, true and uh there was a lot of uh trying to find out in this new sort of uh blockbuster movie land uh how bond would be portrayed in movies and this is one of the films that sort of transitioned into uh you know sort of semi-comedy and semi action, and it was just, it, it a very sort of schizophrenic uh, attempt at figuring out what Bond was. Well, I learned all the wrong lessons from the Spy Who Loved Me, which, by right. the way, also completely threw out the source material. But, yeah, uh, absolutely. But the Spy Who Loved Me, I think, as a story and as a Bond story, worked. Um, but Moonraker is almost beat for beat the Spy Who Loved Me, which is like, almost beat for beat. beat. You only live twice. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Although I think Spy Who Loved Me is better than all of them. Yes. But, but, mm-hmm. but I, I will say this. Save it for James Bond week, guys. <laughs> in terms of what Darren just said, what people forget, and they dismiss this film out of hand because, you know, it's not popular to say you like Moonraker these days. Um, but it was a very, very financially successful movie. It was the biggest Bond movie, I think, uh, since Thunderball. It was hugely successful. And... Um, uh, but what's great about the Bond and franchise? I think part of that was due to the Shadow Star Wars. It, it yes. had spaceships, it right. had lasers, and James Bond. But it's also a self-correcting franchise. Mm-hmm. Like you know, when you do Die Another Day, the next movie is Casino Royale. You know, when you do Moonraker, the next movie is Fear Eyes Only. And what was really interesting, you know, and I think part of that also was you know at the time. UA had just had the failure of Heaven's Gate, and they couldn't do another Moonraker. Moonraker was a big roll of the dice. It was super expensive at the time, and they were lucky. They, they you know, they, 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 it was a good gamble because the movie was successful. You couldn't afford to take a risk on another Moonraker at that point. So you go small and you do for your eyes only. Um, but uh, you know, it's really interesting when you look at the history of the Bond movies that when they tend to get big, then they, they bring them back to Earth, in this case, literally. Um, I don't think you could have continued to go in that direction of Moonraker, you know, now, uh, you know, uh, until Disney acquires the rights where they go to, the, you know, Bond and the Star Wars universe, apparently. But uh, I, I think that um, I think that's what's so great about the Bond movies. And again, that's a conversation for probably another week. But yeah, Moonraker is my nomination for In the Shadow of Star Wars on Thursday. Well, w- I mean, what are some other films? We There's one big one we haven't talked about at all. Um, Star Trek The Motion Picture. Star Trek The Motion Picture. I don't one. think that's a Star Wars ripoff. I think that's a uh, 2001 ripoff. Well, I don't it, think it's well, a ripoff. It's not a ripoff. It's, yeah. I shouldn't say but ripoff. But it exists it's the wrong word. Star Wars existed and was successful. Well, that's an interesting thing. Because, the you know, the... the f- the popular story is that Paramount saw Star Wars open and they said, oh, what have we got that is like spacey? And they said, well, we have this Star Trek thing. 
Um, that's not exactly what happened. What actually happened is that Star Wars opened and the uh, people running Paramount said, oh, well, now now we'll never be able to release Star Trek because the, the market is gone. Everyone has watched Star Wars and everything, and so we're just going to go on with our. With There's our, no future in science fiction. With our, yeah, there's no future yeah. now because it's all the been money they're making. How, it's dead. How, but, but wait, how, how far along were they with Phase Two? Was that done at that point? It, they they were in into doing Phase Two for, for the television. Paramount for for television. Correct. What happened was, in November, Close Encounters opened and did huge, and uh, Charlie Bluthorn head of Paramount and head of Gulf and Western said, my God, that could have been us. Right. Yeah. And that's when they said, okay, we're, we're, we're pulling the rails on this thing and we're going to do the motion picture. And that's how that happened. Well, and also they were very unhappy with the succession of scripts, everything from sure. uh, uh, Phil Kaufman's script. But, you know, when the In Thy Image script was written for uh, Phase 2, mm-hmm. It was the first time that they were relatively – Michael Eisner was relatively happy with the script for a Star Trek project. Right. And, and, and that you know, also along with the success of Star Wars and Close Encounters, you know – and I think you also have to remember, you know, Phase 2 wasn't just canceled because that. The Hughes Network didn't happen. Right. It was supposed to be the cornerstone of a new network and they couldn't put it together. They couldn't right. get the network uh, – make it work. So basically that was going away anyway. Yeah. So what do we do with it? Do we do – we, Piss away all this money we spent on they pre-production spent for ten years yeah. developing various incarnations, of and Star Trek. they were building sets. Yeah, they didn't know that Robert Wise was going to come on and throw out everything that was built. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they figured, okay, we got these sets. Let's do this low-budget movie with Bob Collins, right? You know, and 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 uh, we'll at least you know salvage this investment because at the time it was going to be what a ten million dollar movie, right? Well, well, that's the thing. I mean, Paramount was hoping for a response to Star Wars. But that's not what they got. And if you want to, they read marketed that. it like a new Star Wars, and th- I think that's one of the reasons why Happy Meals, why and... it's perceived as not being successful, even though it made a ton of money. Right. Yeah, it, and it did. And if you want to read more about Star Trek: The Motion Picture, the Fifty Year Mission by Ed Gross and Mark Altman, available <laughs> wherever fine books are sold. Okay, so we also. Well, what are some other? Well, uh, the one I was going to mention was the black hole. Oh yeah, Disney's right. attempt. What to a catch wonderful it. suggestion! <laughs> <laughs> and that's a film, I, uh, 1979, I, uh, I believe. Yeah. I, I remember eagerly going to uh, see that at the local theater and um, having very mixed feelings as a result of it. It's 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 not a good movie. It's no, it's not. Yet it's, it stays with you. It, it yeah, I mean it's. It's kind of all over the map. It's one of those movies you're not quite. Is it a horror movie? Is it an adventure movie? It is a. Is it a mystery? Is well, it a, maybe a kids movie? Or is it all of the above? I mean, it kind of is. It's it's a movie that I one of the few when I was a child that I actually saw in the theater. Like I wanted to see it, mm-hmm. and so uh, we went. But uh, it, when I was what was what what year was that? Was it nineteen seventy nine? Yeah, I mean, I am at that point eight years old. Um, and, and, and I think we were talking about oh this. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. We probably... Ashley and I discovered recently that we grew up in the same area, and we may have seen the film at the same. I saw it at the Manassas Mall. Yeah, that's where I saw it. That's crazy. Yeah, totally. And I think we might have been in the same showing at the Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> yes, at Spring at the Spring that is so crazy. <laughs> it's completely. <laughs> bananas, but like, I but think. No, just, oh, go sorry. Go ahead. I was we just going to say that I just love it. Take into account all. that Friday. This is Friday. We sort of need the chaser, you know, for the week. And in a way, I feel like. Black Hole is that. It has Roddy McDowell as a precocious acerbic <laughs> robot. It has Slim Pickens as a precocious, not as acerbic <laughs> robot. It has, you know, Maximilian Shell hamming it up to 11. Uh, With a robot named Anthony Maximilian? Perkins, you know, as a jittery uh, uh, mother loving scientist. Um, and Yvette Ernest, Mamou, and Ernest, him to go crazy. Ernest Borgnine, because as we said before, kids love Ernest, Ernest Borgnine, Borgnine. And Robert the, the Forster. cowardly Robert journalist, Forster, yeah. and 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 Robert Forster being a badass. In fact, at the Saturn Awards this year, you know, I, I was talking to Robert Forster for a little while. We were waiting to get our tickets out front, and uh, I said, you know, I just loved you on Twin Peaks, and obviously, you know, uh, you know, huge huge fan of yours. I have to say, you know, what next year is because I have no idea what next year is. I said it's the 40th anniversary of the Black Hole, 
And he was like, no way. I said, yeah. I said, what are we doing? <laughs> and he couldn't have been nicer. He was delightful. And, and you know, speaking of black hole people, when, um, <laughs> when, uh, when, when Rob and I were in Cannes, for, with Free Enterprise, our movie Free Enterprise with Bill Shatner, um, we went to this party for Festival of Cannes. It was a movie called Festival of Cannes. Uh, Maximilian Schell was in it. And <laughs> Maximilian Schell and Shatner hadn't seen each other since they shot Judgment in Nuremberg. Right. Oh. And so we brought Shatner in and he was like, and, and him and Maximilian were embracing and they were so happy to see each other and they were talking. And Rob and I just looked at each oh my God, it's Commander Reinhardt and Captain Kirk. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> So. And, and I mean, this is the Black Hole is a movie that's like really creepy. I mean, it's yes, for it, yeah. it's really but, you eerie. Know, it is kids. like a big haunted, haunted house type movie right. with like the crew has been like lobotomized and turned into some kind of weird. <laughs> the dad, drones. her dad, she's looking for her dad. She's yeah. like 90 in that movie. Yeah. Yvette Mimu is like, she's looking for a dad who right. disappeared on this ship. But and know, my what? God, the rope, Maximilian the robot, that thing's scary. Was scary. Right. He killed it. He killed the. He killed Anthony Perkins, Anthony Perkins with, with who tried to protect himself blades. with a spiral notebook. Oh, but he, that, but he, that, that horrified me as a child. Yes, Just yes. the shot is on his face yes. as the whirling blades. But he makes through the book. He makes great margaritas. Oh my god. Okay, okay. But you know what? You know what? We're not. What we? Okay. There, there are two. There are two things which put it over the top. May I, may, I, may I say there are two things that, that I think demand this movie's inclusion on Friday, and those are, in no, n- not in any specific order, the Cygnus which is one of the most magnificent oh, designs because beautiful. it's not influenced it's by Star Wars. It's this Jules Verne yes. insanity. There's nothing about it that's aerodynamic or anything that would mm-hmm. you'd, but you, it's like a haunted house Beautiful in space. Beautiful model. I it's mean, how big gorgeous. was that model there? In like 12 feet or something? It was pretty, pretty it was big. massive. And, and it's, it's just, and we've never seen anything like it. And to this day, we've never seen uh, anything that looks like the Cygnus, you know, which is just a, a gorgeous ship. And I remember when th- you talked about the reveal in Moonraker. Mm-hmm. What about when they first revealed the when, Cygnus? When right. the lights yeah. come on. Come, and the oh, Cygnus. my God. Yeah, I mean, that's freaking awesome. I took my kids to see it at the New Beverly. And and I think I liked it more than they did. But they they, they really <laughs> enjoyed, the you know, there's a lot they liked about it, particularly old Bob. Because when you're, you know, that age, old Bob is the coolest thing oh, ever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, number two. Same as Moonraker. Who's the hero of this movie? John Barry. Barry. John freaking <laughs> Barry. <laughs> and what his, a and his two minutes of music. Oh, yes. repeated my, over yeah. and oh over and over. It doesn't matter it's because it's terrific. two of the best minutes of music <laughs> ever written for the cinema. And, and first digital soundtrack. First <laughs> digital soundtrack. Remember the LP? You don't because you're younger. But right. Um, but they, we, I remember the LP came out and, and, and stuck on the cover. It said, first digital, I bought it at Jimmy's Music World. The second I saw it, first digital soundtrack, I got to have that. Oh, I, I'm gonna, one day there's going to be worth millions of dollars. It's futurized. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it was beamed to us from this, the year 1982. And, and, and <laughs> it's, it's also, uh, along with Star Trek, the motion picture coming out in the same year. Um, were Weeks the, earlier. The, yes. Were the last... Uh, Movies to have uh, Overture. overtures. Oh yes. Oh yeah. So and they were both recorded digitally, by the way. So yeah. The soundtrack. And they were yeah. both great overtures. That's correct. So and people are sitting there. Why are they open the curtains? <laughs> I don't understand. Why are they showing commercials? I loved uh, that shit. I mean, yeah. I saw like I saw both of those films in the theater, and I just thought that was the best thing ever. Just sitting there, it was like I missed it when I didn't hear it in other things. Well, and I love that main title sequence with the big grid of space yeah. with the music playing and you're swooping over it and then you see the, the funnel of the black hole sure. and in the distance and you get closer and then you spiral down into the black hole. Well, spoiler alert, you talked about mind screwing with kids. That ending, right? Oh, yeah. Where they're in hell. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. The, Maximilian is the devil. It's just it's astounding. Well, that's like the, you know, it's, it's own two thousand one sort of in, you know yes. uh, reference where it's I don't want to spoil. I don't want to spoil anything, but you know that's that's happening in the mind of the girl. That's all. That's a dream from Saint Elsewhere. The boy from Saint Elsewhere is imagining it's it like all? happening in a snow Wait, globe. I, I don't understand. No, that, that's a dream sequence it that is. she has when they go through. How do you know? Is that maybe you? She's having. A, she, she's dreaming. All this. Is, it didn't really yeah. happen. Yeah. No, it didn't. They saw that in the black. They went through the black well, hole. That's annoying. They took no. them through hell. That's annoying. I don't believe that. I don't. I, I don't. Who says that? She says that. Watch the movie. Well, that's again. her so, interpretation. <laughs> that's my interpretation. But she's and I'm psychic. standing by it. She can see into this stuff. Remember, yeah. she has ESP powers. Sure. That's how she's able to communicate with them. Right. She has Esper abilities. Well, I think the great thing about it is <laughs> that 
the the <laughs> the crew the crew of the Cygnus are directly relatable to the audience because we're just as numb as they are. Oh, well, thank look, you, uh, guys. So are, are we agreed that this is our week in the shadow of Star Wars? Monday, Battlestar Galactica. Tuesday, Saga of Alien. Star World. Yes, the saga of a Star Wars, Steve. <laughs> Tuesday, Alien. Wednesday, Battle Beyond the Stars. Thursday, Moonraker. And Friday, The Black Hole. I think wow, we're going to have a blockbuster week. We are. I mean, we didn't even mention Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, which Thank was released goodness. theatrically, and I, I saw it in the theater. That but, I didn't see. Um, I think I had pneumonia or something like that. Because it's terrible. terrible. Maybe yeah. we'll do that on Wait, well, It didn't give me the pneumonia. Oh, Spandex oh, week on the 430 right. movie. That's right. Off think. Off think. <laughs> um, so I will say this about the black hole. My my last sort of comment about it. I'm having the strangest sensory experience right now. Um, I think because um, I saw that movie in the theater when I was so young, I remember very strongly the smell of popcorn in the theater, mm. and I like I'm smelling it now. Wow. And it's like there's something about that part of the movie going experience, mm, right? Of just yeah. like. The could theater could be just, a tumor. It could be. <laughs> it could be. But just it just that the memory of that film is just so powerful that it brings. And back, what's funny? Like, we were all remember, very young, and we all remember. I'm sure what theater we saw it at. Yeah. Well, totally. yeah. Nash and I saw it in the Manassas Mall in Virginia, and uh, probably either before or after we paid a visit to the Aladdin's Castle yeah, Arcade right, right across. I the... might have even kicked your yeah. ass. At... <laughs> exactly. Where did you exactly. see it? Where did you see <laughs> it? You remember? I never watched the Black Hole in a, in a theater oh, really? until oh. many years later. I saw it December 24th. Christmas Eve, 1979, at the King's Plaza Theater in Brooklyn, New York. Nice. I remember it like it was yesterday. I don't remember the popcorn, but I remember <laughs> the movie and the overture, and we would always see a movie on Christmas Eve. Now, and- Star Trek The Motion Picture I saw in the Villa Park Cinemas, where every seat is $1.15. Save, for- <laughs> save, save it for Star Trek Week. This has been the 430 movie. Gentlemen, I want to thank you. Where can uh, people continue the conversation with you on social media, Steve Melching? Uh, s- at Stephen Melching. Darren Dockerman? On Twitter, at Darren Doc, one R. Ashley Miller. On Twitter, at Ashmaster Zero. And uh, you can follow me uh, on Twitter and Instagram at Mark A. Altman. I also want to remind you that my new book, So Say We All, comes out uh, this week uh, from Tor Books, available wherever books are sold. And if you're in the Los Angeles area, we will be screening Mission Galactica, The Silent Attack, at the prestigious American Cinematheque's Egyptian Theater with cast and crew from both series on Friday, August 24th. I hope you'll join me for what is sure to be a fantastic evening. But for now, we hope you'll enjoy this week, Shadow of Star Wars Week on the 430 movie. And join us next week when we once again (laughs) visit with the only gentleman spy with the license to kill. No, wait. wait. Isn't next week, uh, are you looking at the right thing? (laughs) Next week, I hope you'll join us for Superhero Week as we go up, up, and away with the world's greatest superheroes only on the 430 Movie. This has been the 430 Movie Special Encore Edition, and this is your host, Mark A. Altman. I want to remind you that we'll be back with all new episodes of the 430 Movie this spring for Season 2. We thank you for joining us for the special Encore presentation, and we hope you'll join us for some of our other shows on the Electric Surge Network, including the ultimate podcast for Star Trek fans with a life, the hit podcast, and glorious Trek experts about all things Trek. If you haven't checked out this show, please do, because it's awesome. And I don't say that about everything, but this is a great show and you'll love it. We also have, for you film fans, the best movies never made. This is Joe Dorosky's Dune producer, Steven Scarlatta, and Josh Miller, writer of Sonic the Hedgehog, where every other Monday they look inside the making or unmaking of a film that never saw the light of a projector bulb with special guests, directors, writers, producers. There have been some great episodes on E.T. 2, Night Skies, Johnny Quest, Godzilla, um, Master He-Man and the Master of the Universe with Adam Rifkin. And, of course, uh, Rob Burnett and myself join them as we talk about Free Enterprise, The Wrath of Shatner, the aborted Free Enterprise sequel. So some great episodes coming up. We hope you'll join us for that wonderful show. And, of course, if you're a Star Trek Discovery fan, join Chase Masterson and her special guests every Sunday night as they do a deep dive into the world of Star Trek Discovery. And meanwhile, Ashley, Darren, Steve, and myself will be back with all new episodes of the 430 movie this spring for season two. Thanks for being 
a 4.30 movie fan, and we'll see you at the movies. This podcast is a production of the Electric Surge Network.